So we're going to take a little stroll through the Grabhorn collection, which is in the rare books room up on the sixth floor. And there are various ways of approaching uh, a collection of books, any collection of books, um, because it's really, a, in one regard, a history of printing, which also encompasses a history of thought, a history of ideas. You could stroll through looking at scientific books. You could look th through at examples of artistic, beautifully printed books, illustrated books. So there are many different ways of going through the collection. And so I thought I would just wander down a few of the little byways um, that just sort of came to mind. There's so many books that I couldn't cover them all in an hour. So I'm just going to go off on a few different tangents. And I thought a good place to start would, would be with Aldous Minutius, since he's in the news. Uh, the New York Times did a story last week. It's the 500th anniversary of his death. Uh, in 1515. Um, he was a really important figure in Venetian printing in the 16th century. Very hip, you can see he was the first person to wear a Kangol hat backwards. <laughs> and so how did he become the man who transformed Venice into the Silicon Valley of medieval Europe? And we'll get there in a minute, but first of all, we need to go back, backpedal 50 years to the introduction of printing in Europe when Gutenberg created the technology that made possible the first printed book from movable type. And so in the middle of the 15th century, we find a lot of books that were being created that were essentially replicas of manuscript books. I've often thought if Gutenberg had been born in the 20th century, he would have invented the Xerox machine. Because basically, <clears throat> he was looking for a way just to replicate manuscript books. And the early market for books was largely liturgical books or legal documents. So almost half of all printing in the 15th century relates to the church or the law. But in fact, it was printing that gave rise to various revolutionary changes, such as the Protestant Reformation and other things that then furthered uh, the enlightenment and the, the uh, development of, and spread of knowledge, which is really wonderful. So this is one of the best sellers of the 15th century. It's an edition of a book that we call The Golden Legend of uh, Jacob de Voragine. He was a Dominican priest from Genoa. He rose to be the bishop of Genoa. He didn't want to be bishop. He was a bit like the current pope. He was more interested in doing charitable acts, such as keeping the, the Guelphs and the Ghibellines from cutting each other's throats. Um, but he did write down the lives of the saints. And this was in order to create a, uh, uh, an organization for the Catholic calendar. Uh, every day in, the, in the, the year, it celebrates a different saint. And so he wrote down all of the known facts of the, of the saints in this book, which is now called The Golden Legend, or Legenda Aurea. Um, this is an edition that was published in um, Augsburg by uh, uh, Bamler, Jacob Bamler, in the uh, 1470s. It's in uh, one size of, of one typeface, a black letter typeface. It's got woodcut illustrations that show the moment of martyrdom. Uh, in this case, it's St. Killian, who was an uh, Irish or Scottish monk who'd gone to, to Rome. They, as you know, uh, the monasteries in Iona and Lindisfarne kept Christianity alive through the uh, 7th and 8th centuries when, it, when the Dark Ages had settled on Europe. So the moment of martyrdom is, is important because it lets the, the people who can't read see what's going on. And um, you can also see that the, the, the figures in the illustration are dressed in typical medieval clothes. So they look just like the cobbler or the shoemaker that uh, suspects that uh, he's going to heaven or hell based on his understanding of, of the text. It, as a book, you can see it doesn't have um, page numbers. It doesn't have chapters. It, it just has a thing at the beginning of von St. Kilian, it's in German, so it's in the vernacular. So there were, it was written in the 13th century by Jacob. By the 15th century, there were 500 manuscript editions, but it also went through 150 printed editions. 
in the first 50 years of printing. So it was an immensely popular book. And um, here's another page showing uh, St. Matthew about to get the chop. <laughs> in his moment of prayer, what are you laughing at? <laughs> There's actually, uh, if you read the Golden Legend, uh, think around oct uh, October 27th, the date is St. Balam Barlam's Day. And I was just reading Sa the legend of St. Barlam. It's identical to the legend of the Buddha. He's, a, he's an Indian prince who uh, eschews uh, his princely ways and goes and meditates to achieve enlightenment. So it was pretty amazing to find that had made it into a Genoese manuscript in the 13th century. So printing really starts to take root in Venice in the 1470s. First, with a Frenchman named Nicholas Jensen, who is an engraver who goes there and starts printing. And then with a German named Erhard Ratdolt, who comes from Augsburg in Germany to Venice to become a printer. He cuts his own type, and he starts to organize the way books are, are created and put things together, such as illustrations, uh, initial letters, which previously were just left to the scribes to color in by hand. He prints in two colors. This is the first edition of the uh, works of Euclid, the mathematics of Euclid from 1482. Ratdolt is the first person to give us a title page. Well, it's more like a colophon, but he tells you what the, who the author is, who the printer is. Um, he's the first person to create beautifully illustrated books like this with mathematical diagrams. This is the first book to have mathematical diagrams, which are, could be bent pieces of metal rule, or they could be engraved. Uh, Theodore da Vinci thinks they were engraved on type metal, and that's why there's so much white in the image in order to get a good solid uh, impression, rather than in wood. Type metal could be locked up and printed quite easily with the type. He was, Raddolt was in Venice for 10 years from 1476 to 1486. He printed something like 67 books before he went back to Augsburg. He took with him the typeface, um, which is an Italian version of the rotunda. And as a result, this Italian style of black letter spread over Europe and began to replace the textura, which the Germans were using. And the only countries that kept using the textura after that were the Netherlands and, and England. So Ratdold is he's often called the printer's printer just for the beauty uh, of his books. Here's the propositions of, of Euclid, big margins to allow for the diagrams. And then again, the initial letters are printed in there, not leaving anything to chance. Um, and as I say, the, he's one of the first people to put page numbers into books, although there aren't page numbers in here. It just says book 13 up there at the top. He was followed by the person we started off with, Aldus Minucius, who was uh, a young man who came from the, the Pontine Marshes down by Rome and ended up in, in um, going up to, to Venice and, and becoming the tutor to Pico della Mirandola, who was a very important uh, Renaissance philosopher and artist. And there was a, a war between, I think, Ferrara and Venice that lasted for a couple of years. So, um, Aldous pretty much spent the whole time in Pico's mansion um, scheming ways to, uh, to get rich or to, to, no, not to get, to publish books. And so um, in the 1490s, Aldous opened his press in Venice. And this is one of the few books, very few books that he printed that was illustrated. It's also one of the very few books that he printed that was in Italian. Most of his books were in Greek or Latin. And this is a book called Hypnoratomachia, which is a word made up, polyphily, or strife of love in a dream. And the young man, Polyphilus, um, uh, which means he loves polia, uh, goes to sleep and he wakes up and he's in the ruins of, of, of antiquity and he wanders around and all these sort of symbolic and hermetic things that go on. And um, in the end, he wakes up, it was all a dream. It's a bit like kind of an Alice in Wonderland of the Middle Ages. You can see that it's in Roman type, that the initial, part, the initial segment is all in capital letters, just like Roman inscriptions from the first century, which is, was the, the inspiration for these letter forms. And then also the initial letter L has been printed from a wood engraving. 
The uh, woodcuts are credited to a man named Bernardo. And um, it's all printed in one size of one typeface. It's really, really a beautiful book. The French collector Jean Grolier, for whom the Grolier Club is named, had six copies. So he obviously really liked it to, in order to own, own six. I guess you could fill it in, you know, painting by numbers, color in the wood, woodcuts to amuse yourself. This is the other book that Aldous printed with wood engravings, and this is the Scriptores Astronomici Veteres of Julius Firmicus Maternus. I guess is Julius Firmicus Maternus, I guess that means Julius of the Hard Mother. Uh, and this is a book of astrology. It's actually a compendium. It's a very unusual, well, not that unusual. It's, it's unusual for Aldous in that it has these woodcuts, which were copied out of a book published by Ratdolt in, the 14, in uh, 1482. Um, but it's unusual in that it's a combination of a, a collection of seven books on astronomy and astrology, which is a kind of poetic astronomy, I guess. Here's Leo. You can see the first word, Leonem, the, the, the constellation for Leo the lion. And uh, I've often thought that it would be great if the library would have an award every year and hire a calligrapher and say, OK, give them the book and say, you know, fill in the letters. <laughs> I mean, it would, be, it would really be nice to, to add the color that was intended. But uh, you know, the scribes didn't bother, and so the books mostly remain like that to this day. This, again, is in his Aldous's Roman type. But he also had a Greek type. And this is the importance of Aldous. He was the, one of the first people to realize that he wasn't interested in printing the religious works for the church or legal works. He wanted to lay down the foundations of Western culture that had existed 2,000 years earlier in, in Greece and in Alexandria and in Rome. And so he started to print these Greek uh, manuscripts. He had a group of, of friends that got together that were passionate about Greek literature. And their idea was they would find these manuscripts and collate them, Aristotle uh, and Plato, uh, Socrates, Sophocles, and so on, had never been printed before, find as many manuscripts as they could, collate and edit them, and put out a really good edition. So this is also from that book of collection of astronomy. And this is the phenomena of Aratus. And that's the little poetry bit in the middle is Aratus' phenomena. And it has the, um, the marginalia is by uh, Theon of Alexandria and was compiled in the fourth century. So one thing about manuscripts is they tended to accumulate marginal notes. So it seemed to the editors it would be a good idea to include the commentary. And if they found two copies of a manuscript with different commentary, sometimes they would combine the commentary and give you sort of a super a hypertext version with all of the commentary possible. You know, sometimes Cicero would have translated and added stuff or um, other writers, so they would uh, add those in there. So these were the earliest works of Aldous, but then he had the brainwave that made him the famous person that he is today. And that was, he thought of producing libelles portatiles, small portable books. His, his audience were scholars, students that didn't necessarily have a lot of money, as much as collectors. So it occurred to him if he could produce more copies of accurate texts, then that would guarantee the sales of his books. So he set out to produce uh, a whole range of classic works in this small five by seven, four and a half by eight format. And that was his great success. Up to that point, books were printed in editions of maybe 200. Aldous's press runs were 1,000. They would sell out, and he would reprint it. At one point, I think he had about four presses operating. He had Cretan typesetters and compositors because they were, they were fluent in, in Greek as well as Italian and could do the typesetting work. This is an edition of, uh, what does it say, Euripides? that has been colored in from the, I believe, the Max Kuhl bequest in the, in the library upstairs. My Greek is non-existent. My, my classics teacher said to me, Johnston, boy, can you give me the distinction between Euripides and Eumenides? And I said, well, Euripides trousers, Eumenides trousers. <laughs> got me detention. 
So what Aldous was really famous for was a series that he began about 1500 and for the first time had italic type cut based on the handwriting. Instead of the Roman type, which was the traditional typeface that was used in formal documents, he wanted to have a typeface that was based more on everyday handwriting. It would be more compact and it would work really well for poetry. So here's uh, the beginning of Aldous's edition of the Inferno of Dante. You can see there's a little space left to the end at the beginning, Nel Mezzo del Camin. And uh, it's, a, again, one of these small format books. So in the period of about 1500 to 1505, Aldous was producing a book about every two months. And the, so word got out, not just in Venice, but all over Europe, that these were the books that you wanted to have. They were, they were the most accurate textually, and they were affordable, and they were also very beautiful books, as you can see. That's a really lovely edition. Who wouldn't, wouldn't want an edition of Dante like that? The result of this was that when Aldous's books got out into the world, immediately people started to copy them. On the left is Aldous's edition of the Epigrams of Marshall from 1501. On the right is a pirated edition printed the same year in Lyon in southern France, just far enough away that the Doge of Venice couldn't do anything about it. Aldous got papal indulgences that said anybody who, oh great, anybody who, uh, who copied his work would be excommunicated. Don't think that had much uh, impact. You see, the books are identical. Aldous was really indignant. He, he published a, a, a broadside complaining about this, stating all the errors that he found in this edition of Marshall. What did the printer do? Reset the book with the corrections. <laughs> it's also believed that Aldous's punch cutter a man named Francesco Grifo may have been complicit in selling copies of the typeface to the French printers too. Uh, we don't know for a fact. All we know about Grifo is that he murdered someone with an iron bar and was hanged. So um, after cutting this beautiful uh, typeface. So um, Aldous's work set a high standard, but it also meant that his types spread into Europe. So there was no need for the vernacular typefaces to uh, remain in, in France, in Germany, and uh, the Low Countries, when people were starting to get used to printing books in uh, Roman and Italic typefaces. Aldous created this press mark that he put in all of his books. Um, it was kind of like a good housekeeping seal of approval that <laughs> appeared in the back. You know, and I think actually some of the piracies even copied this too. They just, you know, they were shameless. But this was sort of a way of saying, you know, accept no substitute. This is an Aldine book. In fact, the publisher Doubleday still uses the Dolphin and Anchor. A lot of publishers use um, press marks. Um, there are a couple of German houses that have a Dolphin and Anchor. Uh, the English printer William Pickering in the 19th century had a Dolphin and Anchor, anchor and uh, and, the, and his motto was Aldus Discipulus uh, Ang Anglia, or Ang Ang Aldus's English disciple. And we have a young lady here who has this tattooed on her left arm. So, uh, and this was a coin that, that Cardinal Bembo had given all this of the uh, old uh, Venetian um, money that uh, he used for his, for his imprint. So all this style moved into France and Venice, of course, uh, uh, the, the Italian uh, states were always breaking out into war and this uh, would cause disruption in the trade. France was in a relative period of stability under Francois I, and so Paris was a uh, center of, of printing, centered around the Sorbonne University, and there was a whole series of, of important publishers, the Estiennes in Paris, and the son-in-law of one of the Est Henri Estienne was Simon de Colline, who's one of the first great artists of the book. He's got uh, his own press mark, as you can see here, it's a, a sort of pan figure with a scythe, of like Father Time. The little cross of Lorraine you see right above the scythe, that's the signature of Geoffrey Torrey, the artist who cut that block. It's got a fully evolved title page. It's, the title of the work is The Poems of the Strozzi, Father and Son. 
and then the imprint, imprint is Paris from the office of Simon de Colleen and the date 1530, everything you would find on a modern title page. It's still, however, a quintessentially Venetian book, not least in the typography, which he copied Aldous's types, but also in the content. The Strozzi were, were courtiers in uh, Ferrara. The father was a, a, a well-known poet. His son was even even better poet, but his son unfortunately ended up as the go-between between Lucretia Borgia and one of her lovers, and he met a, a pointed end of something in the street one night in Ferrara and was found floating in the river the next morning, and nobody ever was held to account. Lucretia, Lucretia Borgia's father was the pope, and he wasn't above cutting a few th throats when it suited him. So uh, the Strozzi were um, celebrated as poets, and this edition actually has an introduction by Aldous Minutius. <clears throat> so, and of course it's in Latin, so that or as would be appropriate. So, this is St Simon de Colleen now developing more fully as a typographer. This is the Terentiani, a book about poetics, published by de Colleen. There's his imprint and press mark again. For the first time, we've got large type. The title of the book, Terentiani, is in a, a what we would call a two-line typeface, so it's twice the size of a text type. Then we've got caps. We've got small caps for the imprint, Parisiis. If we look at the text, you can see um, small caps in the running heads. Page number, again, it's just numbered on the leaf. It's not numbered on every page. So that's page, page number, what is that, 44? So that's 44 recto, and this is 43 verso. So there's no number here, because that's the back of 43. So you just number the page, uh, the leaf rather than the page. It's printed in two colors. So again, not leaving it to somebody to come along and illuminate it. And you can also see how closely his type copies Aldous's type. This is a, this is a colophon from the, uh, one of Aldous's books and the type cut by Grifo. And then this is the Colleen's type, which is a very, very close copy. So right away, you see the importance of Roman type being established for Latin text but also for, it starts to move into the vernacular, and or not just scholarly books, but it moves out, and more and more people start to want books in, in Roman. It's because they find it more readable than black letter, and it becomes a sign of sort of scholarship, uh, Latin and Roman text combined, and that's how Roman starts to spread out and take over the world. One person who wasn't happy about that was the French type cutter Robert Grandjean, he didn't like the idea that these Italian types, particularly Italic, which is named you know, for Italy, which is based on this papal chancery script, is moving out across Europe. So he wanted his, his own familiar handwriting to be the type that people use for vernacular French books. So he, he, when he started out, he was in Lyon, which is that Logduni down there, Excudibat Robertus Grandjean, Typus Propriis, that means printed by Robert Grandjean with his own types. And then 1558 is the date, by uh, ex authoritate regia, with the king's authority. That's Grandjean's press mark. The bulrush is a big grand jonc. Jonc means bulrush, so big bulrush. Um, and then over there on the right, you see the typeface, which is his beautiful uh, uh, a cursive uh, script that he's based on his own writing with all these alternate letters to make it really look like handwriting. The problem was the printers would have needed lots and lots and lots of capital to lay in all the extra, I think there's six Ds, three or four Fs, five or six Es, there's terminal letters, there's swash initial letters. So to make it really look like handwriting, you need more than 26 letters and that gets to be quite an outlay. Besides the printers were starting to be used to Italic and Roman, so unfortunately this never took off. Meanwhile, Simon de Colleen is now producing books with not just beautiful wood engravings, but an authoritative text, but he's now making a play for making a feature of the author. Up until the 16th century, the author didn't matter. The book mattered, but you didn't say, have you got the new one by Petrarch? You just said, 
You know, have you got that book, the love poems about Laura? Oh yeah, I think we have that. So um, now this starts off, Orontii fine, Orons fine, Delphinatis regi mathematicorum professoris, the, the, the dolphin professor, the English would say the dolphin professor, the, in other words, the dauphin, the, of the, you know, the crown prince, professor of mathematics at the Sorbonne. And this is his book, on um, his book on mathematics, there he is, it's a self-portrait of Arantz, Arantz, he's got his fur coat on, he looks really comfy in his chair. And here's, here's Urania, the, the muse of astronomy. And here's his, I guess it's a maxillary globe. So this is a book, it's a book about mathematics, but it's also how you make astrolabes, how you make all of these different instruments, um, you know, how they're constructed and, and their, the use of them. And we've got a fully articulated page. We've got several sizes of type. We've got marginalia. We've got page numbers. So it's a, book, it's a modern book as we would recognize it from the middle of the 16th century. Um, and also it's got these beautiful woodcut illustrations that harmonize perfectly with the woodcut initials and the, the decorative headbands, all of which were cut by Orans himself. Petrus Apianus went one step further and he actually created moving parts in his books. So he's got these pieces that are called volvels. Today we call it an app. <laughs> the, this is uh, the hours of the day. This is a Spanish edition um, by Apianus. And this is how to create a, uh, um, a, a timepiece. You just turn the dials to line up with uh, north and south and the sun and the moon and the stars and you can figure out what time it is, relatively. He also has um, maps of the world. In fact, I think one of his maps you can see the new world uh, is appearing in there. This is one of those books, again, that went into many, many editions. Um, the library has the Spanish edition and it also has this, I believe, German edition in Latin. I love the little uh, clown face in the middle. That hides the knot. So here's how to make a, uh, a timepiece. You, what you do is you fold up, you see the little worn out bit up there at the top? That you grab hold of that and you pull this up. And then you twist the page to line up with the uh, Antarcticus and the North Pole, Elevatio Pola. So you line your book up with the North Pole, you lift this up, you wait for the sun to come out, <laughs> and then it casts a shadow and you say, oh my goodness, it's 7.15. <laughs> yeah, anti meridian I guess it only works in the neighborhood of where the book is printed, I'm sure, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I don't know, don't know how else it would work, but, um, but um, uh, he was a professor, he was also of mathematics, but he was also a printer, so he, he was able to figure all this out himself and engineer these books, and they're in remarkably good shape. There are three or four of these little volvels in there, and you can actually get them to work. The Apianius, um, that one is from um, the 15, I don't know if I, did I show the title page? Oh, that's the wrong thing, let me go back. 1548, oh, it says in big letters there, 1548. <laughs> His name was um, Bidovitz, but he changed it to Apianus, which is Latin for B, because Bida is German for B, so he figured it sounded better. Apianus sounded better than Bidovitz, so Peter Bidovitz. But um, he created his, his, um, his maps were very influential because um, not everybody had figured out, you know, what was around the, the, um, the equator and what was on the other side. This is only less than 50 years after Columbus' trip to India went wrong and he ended up in the Dominican Republic. Um, so, um, you know, people didn't really know what the rest of the world looked like. So these are the beginnings of this longing and trying to figure out uh, sort of the layout of the earth and the fact, the staggering fact that the earth is round. And this is John Dee's edition of Euclid. This is the first edition in English of Euclid, the elements of Euclid. Dee knew Orange Fine, probably had his edition of Euclid also. It's funny because it's printed by John Day, and that's a picture of John Day, not John Dee, although John Dee is, of course, much better known because of his, uh, he was a hermeticist and a, a, and a, a magus and a, a, 
an alchemist. He was also the astrologer to Queen Elizabeth I, um, and had a very interesting life. Uh, did a lot of really crazy things. Right? The, some uh, expedition went off looking for the Northwest Passage, and they came back from Greenland with this black tar that they'd found. And uh, he thought this, if he melted this down, it would be gold. It could transform it into gold. So they sent an expedition to Greenland to bring back boatloads of this black tar, which, of course, was just black tar. <laughs> so uh, strike that one. But this is an important book because it's one of the first times that an author is involved in the typography to the extent that he's specifying type size and layout in order to get the right kind of connection between the information and the printed page. So this is, this is uh, Euclid in English, and John Dee has explained to the printer that he wants each you know, theorem number seven, seventh proposition to be in large italic, and then have a space, and then have the, the explanation of the theorem, and then the proof of the theorem in smaller type. So the sort of articulation of the page is starting to become manifest here in this uh, pretty funkily printed uh, English book. Again, it's not numbered on the leaf, it's just numbered uh, on the page, it's just numbered on the leaf. So that's folio 129. So it's just numbered on the, the recto, on the right-hand page. This is a really spectacular uh, book that the library owns, and it's the Uranometria of Johannes Bayer. And this was produced in 1661, and it's all engraved, and it's a, the most important star map produced up to that point. They still had not, we still had not invented, when I say we, I'm talking about mankind, not just you know, the, those of us here. We still hadn't invented the telescope. <laughs> so what we saw in the sky was based on what Ptolemy had written down back in the, you know, whenever Ptolemy was third century BC or whenever he was. So Ptolemy had identified something like 42 constellations and the works of, of uh, Aldous and so on that we saw were still based on those, what you could see with the naked eye. The Danish um, astronomer Tycho Brahe had made a catalog of 1,200 stars. After Tycho Brahe, the Dutch figured out how to work a sextant. They were able to navigate around Africa and down into the southern hemisphere and discover more constellations and write them down. So Johannes Bayer added another 800 stars to the uh, cosmography, if you like, and he's the person that gave them names. So I guess this is the bear. It doesn't look much like a bear, but um, he's, he gave them all Greek letters. So uh, like Alpha Centauri is the biggest star in the Centaur constellation, and Beta Centauri, second brightest star, and so on. It seems to be a lot of snakes in the sky. I didn't know that. <laughs> There's Cancer, which uh, I think is a really beautiful page. And then I'm not sure what, you probably know better than I do what these are. But this is a, this is a book of all engraved plates. And there's uh, uh, Lepus, the rabbit. And it's come a long way in 150 years from all this, right, to, in terms of the sophistication of the art. One of the nice things about the library's copy is it's got this little marginal drawing on the back of one of the pages of the dog star. <laughs> Serious, as a little kind of dog with a human head there. So this, this whole um, move to engraving meant that, that uh, copper engraving produced a much finer image than woodcut, much sharper. And even the title pages of books began to have copper engraved title pages, which they function pretty much the way a um, dust jacket works today. They would have the, the author's name, the title, and then some kind of emblematic image that suggests what you're about to see inside the book, and even a picture of where the book is published, and various sort of heroic images around the edge. So the artist who created this did much better lettering, crisper lettering than typographic lettering, which was printed from lead type, which is soft and therefore tended to be squishier and more worn looking. So you always got a sharper look from an engraved page. And this led this eccentric Englishman named John Pine to publish a two volume edition of the works of Horace, where he engraved the entire book, including all the type. He engraved everything, not just the images, but all of the, 
all of the text was engraved too. And this book, he had a huge list of subscribers. It took him a while to do it, but this was the hot book of 1733. Everybody who was anybody wanted a copy of this engraved edition of, of Horace. It's not that they didn't have Horace on their bookshelf already. It's kind of like the Gershwin songbook, you know? If you listen to Ella Fitzgerald or somebody singing a Gershwin song, and then if you want to make it, you know, Lady Gaga is the latest example. She's got to go out there and try and match up to those great singers like Julie Andrews or whoever and, and uh, make her mark with that same material. So this is what this is about. It's about saying, there's, a, there's your Aldine Horace, here's my Horace. Now you can compare them. And so this led to a change in the way metal type was created. And the beginnings of that were an eccentric Englishman named John Baskerville. And he spent seven years producing his first book, The Works of Virgil. And he had new type cut. He had new paper made. For the first time, we've got laid paper. You see the little lines in the paper? It's laid paper. He's got sharper type. He had his own ink made. He bought this secret formula that involved burnt grape leaves. And he produced this bigger, more elegant, cleaner page with more space between the lines to emphasize the type. And he gets rid of all ornament, all decoration. He just focuses your attention. Well, there's that little line of ornaments there. But he focuses your attention on the letter forms. And this created a sensation. Mainly in, in France and Italy, the English weren't that impressed. They complained about something called Baskerville Eye, from uh, how startling his books look. But, <laughs> This led to people imitating Baskerville's type. The Fry Foundry was the first, and this is the Fry specimen. The, the library has the best collection of Fry type specimens in the world. It's really a great collection. And so the Fry Foundry copied Baskerville's types, and um, they didn't really catch on that well, so they went back to copying the Caslon type, which was the style before that. But at this time, we begin to see the beginnings of decorated types. This is the work of Richard Austin, person about whom I just wrote a book. And this is Austin's foundry in the 1830s, creating what we now would call display type, decorated letter forms. These are Tuscans that have drop shadows. And then here's this magnificent uh, three-dimensional illusional typeface. It's basically a slab serif made out of little sacks of sugar or something, <laughs> something delicious. The pinnacle of this trend towards sharper and crisper type was the work of this man, Giambattista Bodoni, who was the last of the printers that had royal patronage. He was supported by the Duke of Parma, and so he had nice apartments in Parma, and he, all he had to do was cut beautiful type and print beautiful books and pose for his, uh, his portrait once in a while. And that's a, that's a little verse from... Um, Ode to a uh, Favorite Pet Cat Drowned in a Bowl of Goldfish by Thomas Gray. Bodoni printed two books in English that were sold by a publisher in Pall Mall called Edwards, Poems of Gray, and The Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole, sixth edition. Uh, in, in his brilliant, crisp type with big margins, Walpole hated the hated these books. He said that this was the, the, the wrongest edition of his book, Castle of Otranto, which is the first Gothic horror novel, by the way. Not really worth reading if you're into Gothic horror. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, but, but Walpole himself was a printer. He had a press at Strawberry Hill, which is his little um, Gothic mansion out in Twickenham. And uh, he had published the Odes of Grey. He was the first person to publish Grey. So he had a proprietary interest in both of these works. So he wasn't happy with Bodoni coming along and producing these fancy, really what we would now call coffee table editions, because again, they were mainly about having this expensive book rather than about something you were going to curl up in your hammock and read. Now we come to our last example of the Euclid. And this is Oliver Byrne's edition that was published by Pickering in 1847 where Byrne had this revolutionary idea of explaining the theorems with, by the use of color. Consequently, Byrne's Euclid has this look of a sort of postmodern, you know, Kenneth Nolan, whatever, uh, abstract uh, work. It's just kind of ruined by the fact that Pickering insisted on using these French 
uh, initials, and then also this uh, used Caslon type with the long S, also proportional, and <laughs> if for magnitude of the same kind, etc. It's it's really preposterous. <clears throat> This is, and this is almost 50 years after the abandonment of the long S. But the way he's used color is just, is just wonderful. Unfortunately, by the 1840s, books were printed on very acidic paper. They were using wood pulp in the paper. So the books, as you can see, are in really bad shape. They got a lot of uh, damage from the, the acid in the, in the paper. But England was now on its way to beginning what we would call the revival of fine printing, an awareness of this, not just these French Crible initials the Pickering's using, but a whole kind of uh, appreciation of, of uh, the, the possibilities for printing. One of the people that was really influential is this man, one of my heroes, Andrew Tuer. He had a press in London called the Leadenhall Press, and his parents wanted him to be a, a clergyman, but he wanted to be a printer, and his best friends were the people that wrote and illustrated Punch magazine. So he hung out with the punch artists in London, and he edited a newspaper called the, the Paper and Printing Trades Journal. And people would write and say, I need help with my design, or I need, got, I need some ideas, you know, what do you think of this? I'm sending you an example of my work for critique, kind of like a Facebook group before the fact. And so he had this idea, he said, okay, everybody send in 100 copies of their best piece of printing. We'll bind them together and send them back to everybody who's, who responds. So he started this International Printers Specimen Exchange. Fortunately for us, there were three printers in San Francisco in 1880 who participated. So there were three sets. There's one here, there's one at uh, the California Historical Society. I'm not sure where the third, I think there's volumes floating around. So the Printers International Specimen Exchange created this movement that's now called the Artistic Printing Movement, where printers began to use not just these crazy typefaces, but color tint blocks, setting type on the diagonal, creating elaborate borders, doing fancy printing with overprinting in gold and so on. And this was all thanks to Tuer's idea for having this annual exchange, which ran for about 12 years. And he published a lot of really interesting books. One of the most curious is this one little book, about four by five, called Quads Within Quads. It's gold stamp cover bound in vellum. And Here's the mechanical typesetter, again, uh, long, be 100 years before its time, the idea of a mechanical typesetter. And Quads Within Quads is a collection of really lame jokes from his newspaper that he just put together, you know, jokes about glue, eating glue and all this kind of thing. But what's great about it is if, if you look at the cover, it says, notice, in unlocking the form, be sure the quads do not fall out, which is, a, you know, when you're a printer and you have a form, which is a metal chase, uh, when you unlock it, you've got to make sure the spacing material doesn't all fall out. Well, the quad within, you get to the middle of the book, the pages are glued together, the last half of the book is hollowed out, and there's a miniature version of the book you've just read tucked into a little hole in the back. And it even has these little Neticons or whatever they're called, made out of monkey face, made out of asterisks, dingbats. So the revival of printing in England it starts in the 1880s with people like the Reverend Daniel and Charles Ricketts, who's ha having his books printed at the Ballantine Press, and most famously, William Morris. And this is a book written by Ricketts at his Vale Press called The Defense of the Revival of Printing, arguing for why it's important that people have gone back to this William Morris uh, era, uh, William Morris has gone back to this Venetian ideal of the books that were printed by Rat Dolt and, and Jensen and Aldous and tried to recreate that. Uh, unfortunately, their typographical ideas leave something to be, de to be desired. I mean, what Morris is great as an interior designer, so his books are just kind of like furniture or wallpaper. They don't really function as, as books as much as they do as decorative objects. And then the other big story recently is this discovery of the Dove's type in the Thames that you probably saw in the, in the blogosphere and, and online. The Dove's press was the venture of Morris's neighbor, Thomas James Cobden Sanderson, and Morris's partner, Emery Walker. Emery Walker had a photo engraving company, and he gave a slide lecture in London in the eight, early 1890s where he showed enlarged 
photographs like this of Venetian pages. And Morris and all of these other people that were there were completely galvanized. And they said, we need to create type like that. So with the help of Emery Walker, Morris created his own typeface. But Walker didn't want to go into partnership with Morris because Morris's personality was too big. And he would have been steamrolled. But he, once Morris died, his binder who lived next door, Thomas James Cobden Sanderson, you see the book, beautiful leather binding here, is bound in 19, 1902 by C.S. Cobden Sanderson. Cobden Sanderson and Walker decided to start a press called the Doves Press. The Doves is the name of the bar on their street in Hammersmith. It's where Nell Gwynn used to meet Charles I. And um, so it's nothing to do with, well, at some point it had to do with birdies, but it's really the, just the local. So um, Cobden Sanderson uh, started this press. Like the Venetian printers, they had one size of one type, a Roman type. And then to illustrate their books, they hired calligraphers. These are really, really, really incredibly beautiful books. People say, well, they're not readable. But I sat down I, with a copy of Sartor Resartus uh, by Carlyle in the Bancroft Library, read the whole thing cover to cover, and didn't think, oh, this is a weird type. It was actually very readable. So um, someone suggested, now that the Dove's type is being dug out of the Thames, oh, we should clone it and cast it and give it to all the printing schools to print books. <laughs> You know, Cobden Sanderson threw it in the river for a good reason. He really, he really did not want a bunch of, of first-year printing students mangling their stupid concrete poetry uh, in his typeface. And I don't blame him. The Arangi Press is the most incredible of all the English private presses. And Robert Grabhorn collected their work. And there's a really nice collection. This was the work of Esther. Uh, and Lucien Pizarro. Lucien was the son of Camille, the French painter. And Camille Pizarro wanted to create a, an arts and crafts community in his French village, kind of like what he saw going on in London. So he sent Lucien to London to study printing and wood engraving. And the idea was he would learn that and come back. Another son was a sculptor. Another one was doing metal work and so on. They were all going to get together and create this craft society. Of course. Lucien fell in love with a nice girl he met in London <laughs> named Esther Ben Susan and got married and never went back. So they used the veil type to print this Book of Ruth with his wood engravings, which is really nice. And then this spectacular edition of The Queen of the Fishes was done from manuscript and printed from process blocks. But then the, uh, the colors were done from wood blocks and printed in every copy. And this is, uh, again, bound in vellum. Beautiful little miniature and a great example of what a private press book is capable of instead of just reprinting old chestnuts all the time. Dubs was the only one of the private presses to print the Bible, the whole thing. It's in four or five volumes. Of course, the Bible is owned by the Oxford and Cambridge University presses. They have the rights to it, so you have to get it, in this case, from the University of Cambridge to do it. But Dubs did a Bible. We saw that in the beginning by Edward Johnston back there. But they did the five-volume Bible all in one, their one size of their one typeface. The only other uh, press that comes close to the Dove's Press or the Orangi Press, in my opinion, is the Golden Cockrell Press. And they didn't do the Bible. They just did the four Gospels. And it was produced in about six months as opposed to four or five years um, by Eric Gill and Charles Gibbings. Gill did the typography. He even designed the typeface, which is named for the press, Golden Cockrell, which is kind of a bolder version of his Perpetua with sort of Caslon overtones. And he cut the wood engravings. And it's a wonderful expression of 1930s bookmaking. It's, the women are flappers, clearly. You know, they're, uh, in fact, I put this image in because um, it shows this is Salome dancing for Herod. But it actually shows Herod as Charles Gibbings. And Eric Gill, they went to the Folie Bergère one night in Paris to see um, Josephine Baker dancing. And so this is, a re this is their Gill's record of that. Um, Gill had just written his wonderful book about typography, where he said text should be set with the thinnest possible space between the words, and then it doesn't matter where the line ends, instead of having a justified margin. So I love that ragged margin. And then he designed each opening. Uh, and they readjusted the typography in the pages so that they all have a beautiful uh, presence on the page, each section opening. And he did, did some little 
borders and so on. But he used it's, this two sizes of type and then the larger things are woodcuts by Gill. And he did it all just in a few months. It's a spectacular piece of bookmaking. And finally, uh, another book in the collection, also from the 30s, is H.G. Wells' Treasure in the Forest, illustrated by W.A. Dwiggins, who's an American designer. And he's the opposite of Gill. Gill used that black really forcefully for strong color in his books. Dwiggins uses no black. He has non-key line images where he just uses the color. And the color is applied by pochoir stencils. The text is set in Caslon, and then the images are, are stenciled onto the page um, by Dwiggins. And then here's another one of the images in the final colophon of the book, where it says that the typography was done by Moano Masasi. Uh, the stenciling was done under his direction by Dwiggins, and the colors and the ink were mixed by Dr. Herman Puterschein. All three of them are Dwiggins. And in fact, <laughs> everybody involved in the book signed it, but half of them are Dwiggins. <laughs> So that's, and that was only produced in 130 copies. And it was also, although Dwiggins designed a lot of books with pochoir, it's the only one that he actually did all the pochoir himself all the way through. So that's just some of the things in the collection. And I thank you. <laughs>